What's up you guys, welcome to another episode of Retro Rewind, as today we'll look back at a movie that took the concept of a martial arts tournament to a whole new meaning. And not to mention, it was also inspired by one of the most successful fighting video game franchises of all time, and I'm talking about Mortal Kombat the Movie, released in 1995. Before we begin this video, make sure you head over to my channel and click that subscribe button for more nostalgic videos on beloved properties from the 80s and 90s. Mortal Kombat was a film that instantly became one of my all-time favorite movies as a kid. Being introduced to the franchise at an early age and a fan of the martial arts era in the 90s, I immediately fell in love with the concept of ninjas, sorcerers with powers, different realms, and humans defending the earth, all mixed into one story. I was no stranger to the name due to all the source materials I had growing up, from the comic books all the way up to the video games. Unfortunately, despite being an avid collector of the franchise, I don't own any action figures, at least not yet, because it's so hard to find one company that actually makes every single figure that's known but there are some options out there, so I'm working on it. Nonetheless, by renting this movie countless of times at Blockbuster and owning multiple versions of this movie, whether it's a VHS, the animated version, or the DVD, what I can remember is my best friend and I putting on techno music, strobe lights, and kicking each other's asses until one of us loses. Little did we know that the endless amount of sleepovers, staying up late and playing the video games, surfing the internet to uncover secrets, and drawing our favorite characters would allow us to forever stay loyal to the brand. The basic premise of the film is that an evil sorcerer and shapeshifter named Shang Tsung is hosting a tournament called Mortal Kombat on a sacred island where fighters from around the world are summoned to partake in a life or death situation to protect their world or realm, so to speak, in return for the ultimate prize of immortality and crowned as the champion of Mortal Kombat. The movie really doesn't waste any time as it introduces us to our three main characters, whom each have their own personal vendetta on a specific matter regarding their life. However, the great thing about this is that each character also learns how to put aside their own egos in order to work as a team. For example, up first, you have Johnny Cage, a cocky, struggling movie actor who's invited to the tournament to help rebuild his damaged reputation as a movie star, hoping that being victorious, people and his fans will take his acting credentials seriously as well as being a fighter. Despite using jokes to escape serious dilemmas, Johnny also fears of being a fake, yet has an interesting story arc. Not only does he befriend a new character named Art Lee, in which we don't really see how this bond progressed, but after his death and throughout the movie, he learns to believe in his own path to do what's right, even if that means putting his own life before others. Then you have Sonya Blade, a special forces agent, a tough comrade who is on the hunt for a mercenary named Kano who previously killed one of her partners during an ambush. Although she wasn't personally invited to the tournament, she snuck in on board anyways after seeing Kano become a stowaway. Surprisingly, we do get a glimpse of her partner Jax, who has a very minor role in the movie, and although they both enter a club unnecessarily hitting innocent people and shooting the shit out of others, his appearance was very brief and never seen again. Little did we know that he had an important storyline later on. However, Sonya's problem is that she's afraid to admit that she needs help or has a hard time trusting others. Either way, she soon learns what teamwork is all about. The movie also briefly shows a romantic connection between Sonya and Johnny, which is kind of important. It briefly touches up on it since he flirts with her throughout the tournament. Last, you have our main protagonist, Liu Kang, a Shaolin monk who fled to America for a better life after disbelieving the principles of what his forefathers practiced. Until, that is, when soon learning that his younger brother Chan died at the hands of Shang Tsung, Liu Kang takes it upon himself to get revenge and justice for his brother and enters a tournament. Liu Kang probably has the most character development as he fears his own destiny and practically is guilty for Chan's death. Eventually, he accepts what fate has to offer and understands everyone is responsible for their own path, thus resulting in Liu to overcome his fear of being weak and believing in himself. Upon entering the ship where all the other fighters seem to have disappeared, each of our three characters get acquainted with each other with some goofy one-liners, humor, skepticism, until Sonya wanders off in search for Kano, because she clearly doesn't give two shits about what's going on so it's all she cares about. When being harassed by Shang Tsung in the lower level, here we get one of the most badass, spine-chilling introductions to two of the most beloved Mortal Kombat characters in the franchise. Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Deadliest of enemies. I mean, just look at Scorpion. His blank stare is enough to give you goosebumps and definitely is intimidating enough to take seriously. Unfortunately, that's as far as their iconic debut goes as both Sub-Zero and Scorpion get their asses tossed all over the ship by the God of Thunder, Raiden. I mean, look how embarrassing this is. Here you have two amazing looking characters and already have Sub-Zero being zapped to the door, Scorpion flying around to only have them both disappear like nothing happened. It's absolutely disappointing. Now going back to Raiden, we learned that he's the God of Thunder, or Lightning in this movie, and is also the protector of Earthrealm. 
He basically acts as their mentor who throws a few jokes and technically can't get involved in their decisions or the actual tournament, yet helps them find their purpose as all three characters have been chosen to protect Earthrealm and explains the rules of Mortal Kombat. To briefly sum it up, Mortal Kombat is a martial arts tournament held once every generation with the intention of having realms invade one another. But in order to do so, you need 10 consecutive wins in the tournament and the competitor from the realm called Outworld only has 9, held by the reigning champion Prince Goro, who mind you looks incredible. Let's admire how amazing this animatronic version of Goro looks for its time. You didn't need CGI back then to get the vision across and I think they absolutely nailed this version of him. Anyways, to prevent Earth from being conquered by Outworld, it is up to our heroes to defend Earth and stop this invasion by having one of them win, unaware that amongst the three, one will be the chosen one. So as our characters arrive to the island and adapt to its surroundings, this is where the movie falls a bit short in terms of explaining just exactly how the rules of Mortal Kombat applies when it comes to keeping score of who's fighting who. Because it seems like any of these characters can just wander off, fight anyone they want, and although the point is to kill your opponent, some even make it out alive, intentionally. For example, aside from wasting all the food on the table, Sub-Zero returns from being zapped by Raiden to demonstrate just how badass he is, even though he just made a fool of himself earlier on. From this point forward, the combatants participating in this tournament make zero sense, as not only is it confusing as to what the ranking system is in order to get to Prince Goro, but where that information lacks, we instead just get awesome back-to-back -back fight scenes to save time and explanations. We have fight scenes like the three Earthrealm warriors fighting Shang Tsung's guardsmen, Liu Kang vs Hakim the Machine Alston from WMAC Masters, in which this scene, we see Shang Tsung use his soul snatching fatality, because that's what he's known for, by stealing the souls of dead combatants to gain their strength. You have Sonya Blade vs Kano, in which she justifies the death of her partner while getting her ass kicked. Johnny Cage vs Scorpion, in which Johnny happens to be walking in the middle of a forest and randomly stumbles upon a fierce scorpion who's just standing there. Not to mention, he knows how to utilize his shadow kick through a stroke of luck. So when fighting, in which I believe is Netherrealm, we see his famous photograph, Fatality. And to be quite honest, as a kid, I just thought Scorpion was a fan of Johnny Cage and had his autograph underneath his gi, which was hilarious. But my question is, how did he get out of there? There's also Johnny Cage vs Prince Goro, which I don't know how he advanced to that level so quickly, but it's a brief yet good attempt. However, despite giving Goro a punch to the balls Van Damme style, the real fight doesn't happen until being on the edge of the cliff, and when they show us, it's a faraway shot, which sucks because the fight had so much potential. Nonetheless, it's paced slow enough until a few kicks causes Goro to fall to his doom. Then there's Liu Kang vs Kitana, the princess of Adenia, who not only has him become totally obsessed over her and fails to kill her when fighting, but Shang Tsung, who's also watching, just allows them to fool around in the sand. Nonetheless, she also acts as an aid to the group giving them advice on how to defeat their opponents, like when Liu Kang fights Sub-Zero. As another great fight scene, again, who's keeping score? He just happens to walk down the stairs and starts fighting with no crowd or witnesses, but if it wasn't for Kitana, he would have gotten his ass frozen to death. Then there's my favorite fight scene where Liu Kang fights Reptile, a CGI lizard instructed to spy on the warriors who oddly takes the form of a statue and becomes a ninja. Regardless how badass this entire fight scene was in learning how to use his famous bicycle kick, Johnny Cage happens to be waiting outside this whole time and doesn't even bother helping him. So as you can see, a lot of these fight scenes get straight to the point for the sake of fan service. Yet, I'm not complaining, I actually love them all. Now, aside from fighting, one of the biggest highlights of the whole film is Shang Tsung. Not only does he like to play his own games, change stipulations of the match, cheat, and go against the rules of the tournament, but his acting is so damn on point. All his facial expressions really give it that vibe of a menacing sorcerer who never really smiles unless committing a kill or has a straight stare to mean business. You definitely don't want to mess with this guy. Although the movie doesn't really show his reactions of how he dealt with Prince Goro, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, and Reptile being killed, thankfully Raiden calls him out for being a coward when finding a loophole to challenge Sonya Blade as collateral after making a deal with Johnny Cage since he defeated Goro. By the end of the movie when everyone's calling out his bullshit, he hilariously starts finding challengers to face until Liu Kang accepts his destiny and then decides to challenge him in Mortal Kombat. Now, aside from fighting warriors from the dead, this fight scene between Liu Kang and Shang Tsung is the most adrenaline moment because everything is at stake within the hands of Liu Kang. Not only do we get the iconic Mortal Kombat song, but it divides the fight into rounds like the video game as each character has their ups and downs with one last attempt to trick Liu Kang into tapping into his vulnerable side, as emotional as it is seeing him talk to his brother Chan, 
He literally saw Shang Tsung transform right in front of him, so how is he falling for this? Anyways, that didn't last long as round 3 occurs with Liu Kang getting his ass kicked but redeeming shortly after. With an awesome fireball to a pit of spikes, Shang Tsung is defeated and Liu Kang shares a heartfelt moment with Chan Soul, who is finally free. What I love about this scene is that the song by Orbital, Halcyon On and On, playing in the background is warming enough to tell you that the world is safe. Earthrealm is saved, and there's nothing more that can put a smile on my face than hearing Liu Kang say, Let's go home after everything they've been through. As our heroes celebrate, we get interrupted by ruthless, badass-voiced and looking Emperor Shao Kahn himself, stating he'll come for their souls. With none of the warriors backing down, you knew a sequel was coming, giving us once again the iconic Mortal Kombat scream. I remember walking out of the theaters in the 90s knowing that everything will be alright. The sun was setting in the peak of the summer, the mood was just right, and the anticipation for a sequel only left a thousand questions in my mind. There was just so many possibilities and characters to progress the story. But little did we know, what was to come a few years later would take a turn for the worse. This movie will forever be the best Mortal Kombat movie to exist. Sure, it's not perfect, but it's a damn impressive one. What more can you ask for in terms of dark and edginess, amazing animatronics, new use of CGI, character development, and seeing majority of your favorite characters or main characters from the first two games is just awesome. The soundtrack is amazing, the costumes were decent, but pretty flawless for the ninjas as I love their simple designs, and there's enough action to keep your eyes glued to your seats. Therefore, Mortal Kombat the movie gets a B plus slash A. Thanks for watching, be sure to give a like and subscribe for more retro movie reviews, and I'll see you all next episode.